Book Fourth, Chapter One of The Ambassadors by Henry James. I've come, you know, to make you break with everything, neither more nor less, and take you straight home, so you'll be so good as immediately and favourably to consider it. Strether, face to face with Chad after the play, had sounded these words almost breathlessly, and with an effect at first positively disconcerting to himself alone. For Chad's receptive attitude was that of a person who had been gracefully quiet while the messenger, at last reaching him, has run a mile through the dust. During some seconds after he had spoken, Strether felt as if he had made some such exertion. He was not even certain that the perspiration wasn't on his brow. It was the kind of consciousness for which he had to thank the look that, while the strain lasted, the young man's eyes gave him. They reflected, and the deuce of the thing was that they reflected really with a sort of shyness or kindness, his momentarily disordered state, which fact brought on in its turn for our friend the dawn of a fear that Chad might simply take it out, take everything out, in being sorry for him. Such a fear, any fear, was unpleasant. But everything was unpleasant. It was odd how everything had suddenly turned so. This, however, was no reason for letting the least thing go. Strether had the next minute proceeded as roundly, as if with an advantage to follow up. Of course I'm a busybody, if you want to fight the case to the death, but after all mainly in the sense of having known you, and having given you such attention as you kindly permitted when you were in jackets and knickerbockers. Yes, it was knickerbockers. I'm busybody enough to remember that. And that you had, for your age, I speak of the first faraway time, tremendously stout legs. Well, we want you to break. Your mother's heart's passionately set upon it, but she has, above and beyond that, excellent arguments and reasons. I've not put them into her head. I needn't remind you how little she's a person who needs that. But they exist. You must take it from me as a friend, both of hers and yours, for myself as well. I didn't invent them. I didn't originally work them out. But I understand them. I think I can explain them, by which I mean make you actively do them justice. And that's why you see me here. You had better know the worst at once. It's a question of an immediate rupture and an immediate return. I've been conceited enough to dream I can sugar that pill. I take at any rate the greatest interest in the question. I took it already before I left home, and I don't mind telling you that, altered as you are, I take it still more now that I've seen you. You're older, and, I don't know what to call it, more of a handful, but you're by so much the more I seem to make out to our purpose. Do I strike you as improved? Strether was to recall that Chad had at this point inquired. He was likewise to recall, and it had to count for some time as his greatest comfort, that it had been given him, as they said at Woolwich, to reply with some presence of mind, I haven't the least idea. He was really for a while to like thinking he had been positively hard, on the point of conceding that Chad had improved in appearance, but that to the question of appearance the remark must be confined, he checked even that compromise, and left his reservation bare. Not only his moral, but also, as it were, his aesthetic sense had a little to pay for this, Chad being unmistakably, and wasn't it a matter of the confounded grey hair again? handsomer than he had ever promised. That, however, fell in perfectly with what Strether had said. They had no desire to keep down his proper expansion, and he wouldn't be less to their purpose for not looking, as he had too often done of old, only bold and wild. There was indeed a signal particular in which he would distinctly be more so. Strether didn't, as he talked, absolutely follow himself. He only knew he was clutching his thread, and that he held it from moment to moment a little tighter. His mere uninterruptedness during the few minutes helped him to do that. He had frequently for a month turned over what he should say on this very occasion, and he seemed at last to have said nothing he had thought of. Everything was so totally different. But in spite of all he had put the flag at the window. This was what he had done, and there was a minute during which he affected himself as having shaken it hard, flapped it with a mighty flutter, straight in front of his companion's nose. It gave him really almost the sense of having already acted his part. The momentary relief, as if from the knowledge that nothing of that at least could be undone, 
sprang from a particular cause, the cause that had flashed into operation in Miss Gostrey's box with direct apprehension, with amazed recognition, and that had been concerned since then in every throb of his consciousness. What it came to was that with an absolutely new quantity to deal with, one simply couldn't know. The new quantity was represented by the fact that Chad had been made over. That was all. Whatever it was, was everything. Strether had never seen the thing so done before. It was perhaps a specialty of Paris. If one had been present at the process, one might little by little have mastered the result. But he was face to face, as matters stood, with the finished business. It had freely been noted for him that he might be received as a dog among skittles, but that was on the basis of the old quantity. He had originally thought of lines and tones as things to be taken, but these possibilities had now quite melted away. There was no computing at all what the young man before him would think, or feel, or say, on any subject whatever. This intelligence Strether had afterwards to account for his nervousness, reconstituted as he might, just as he had also reconstituted the promptness with which Chad had corrected his uncertainty. An extraordinarily short time had been required for the correction, and there had ceased to be anything negative in his companion's face and air as soon as it was made. "'Your engagement to my mother has become then what they call here a fait accompli?' It had consisted, the determinant touch, in nothing more than that. Well, that was enough, Strether had felt, while his answer hung fire. He had felt at the same time, however, that nothing could less become him than that it should hang fire too long. Yes, he said brightly, it was on the happy settlement of the question that I started. You see, therefore, to what tune I'm in your family. Moreover, he added, I've been supposing you'd suppose it. Oh, I've been supposing it for a long time, and what you tell me helps me to understand that you should want to do something. To do something, I mean, said Chad, to commemorate an event so, what do they call it, so auspicious. I see you make out, and not unnaturally, he continued, that bringing me home in triumph as a sort of wedding present to mother would commemorate it better than anything else. You want to make a bonfire, in fact, he laughed, and you pitch me on. Thank you, thank you. And he laughed again. He was altogether easy about it, and this made Strether now see how at the bottom, and in spite of the shade of shyness that really cost him nothing, he had from the first moment been easy about everything. The shade of shyness was mere good taste. People with manners form could apparently have, as one of their best cards, the shade of shyness too. He had leaned a little forward to speak, his elbows were on the table, and the inscrutable new face that he had got somewhere, and somehow, was brought by the movement nearer to his critics. There was a fascination for that critic in its not being, this ripe physiognomy, the face that under observation, at least, he had originally carried away from Woollett. Strether found a certain freedom on his own side in defining it as that of a man of the world, a formula that indeed seemed to come now in some degree to his relief that of a man to whom things had happened and were variously known. In gleams, in glances, the past did perhaps peep out of it, but such lights were faint and instantly merged. Chad was brown and thick and strong, and of old Chad had been rough. Was all the difference, therefore, that he was actually smooth? Possibly, for that he was smooth was as marked as in the taste of a sauce or in the rub of a hand. The effect of it was general. It had retouched his features, drawn them with a cleaner line. It had cleared his eyes and settled his colour, and polished his fine square teeth, the main ornament of his face, and at the same time that it had given him a form and a surface, almost a design. It had toned his voice, established his accent, encouraged his smile to more play, and his other motions to less. He had formerly, with a great deal of action, expressed very little, and he now expressed whatever was necessary with almost none at all. It was as if, in short, he had really, copious perhaps but shapeless, been put into a firm mould and turned successfully out. The phenomenon, Strether kept eyeing it as a phenomenon, an eminent case, was marked enough to be touched by the finger. He finally put his hand across the table and laid it on Chad's arm. 
If you'll promise me, here on the spot and giving me your word of honour, to break straight off, you'll make the future the real right thing for all of us alike. You'll ease off the strain of this decent but nonetheless acute suspense in which I've for so many days been waiting for you, and let me turn in to rest. I shall leave you with my blessing and go to bed in peace. Chad again fell back at this, and his hands pocketed settled himself a little, in which posture he looked, though he rather anxiously smiled, only the more earnest. Then Strether seemed to see that he was really nervous, and he took that as what he would have called a wholesome sign. The only mark of it hitherto had been his more than once taking off and putting on his wide-brimmed crush hat. He had at this moment made the motion again to remove it, then had only pushed it back, so that it hung informally on his strong, young, grizzled crop. It was a touch that gave the note of the familiar, the intimate and the belated, to their quiet colloquy, and it was indeed by some such trivial aid that Strether became aware at the same moment of something else. The observation was at any rate determined in him by some light too fine to distinguish him from so many others, but it was none the less sharply determined. Chad looked unmistakably during these instants, well, as Strether put it to himself, all he was worth. Our friend had a sudden apprehension of what that would on certain sides be. He saw him in a flash as the young man marked out by women, and for a concentrated minute the dignity, the comparative austerity, as he funnily fancied it, of this character affected him almost with awe. There was an experience on his interlocutor's part that looked out at him from under the displaced hat, and that looked out moreover by a force of its own, the deep fact of its quantity and quality, and not through Chad's intending bravado or swagger. That was then the way men marked out by women were, and also the men by whom the women were doubtless in turn sufficiently distinguished. It affected Strether for thirty seconds as a relevant truth, a truth which, however, the next minute had fallen into its relation. "'Can't you imagine there being some questions,' Chad asked, "'that a fellow, however much impressed by your charming way of stating things, would like to put to you first? Oh, yes, easily. I'm here to answer everything. I think I can even tell you things of the greatest interest to you that you won't know enough to ask me. We'll take as many days to it as you like. But I want, Strether wound up, to go to bed now. Really? Chad had spoken in such surprise that he was amused. Can't you believe it, with what you put me through? The young man seemed to consider. Oh, I haven't put you through much, yet. Do you mean there's so much more to come? Strether laughed. All the more reason, then, that I should gird myself. And as if to mark what he felt he could by this time count on, he was already on his feet. Chad, still seated, stayed him, with a hand against him, as he passed between their table and the next. Oh, we shall get on. The tone was, as who should say, everything Strether could have desired and quite as good the expression of face with which the speaker had looked up at him and kindly held him. All these things lacked was their not showing quite so much as the fruit of experience. Yes, experience was what Chad did play on him, if he didn't play any grossness of defiance. Of course experience was in a manner defiance, but it wasn't at any rate, rather indeed quite the contrary, grossness, which was so much gained. He fairly grew older, Strether thought, while he himself so reasoned. Then, with his mature pat on his visitor's arm, he also got up. And there had been enough of it all by this time to make the visitor feel that something was settled. Wasn't it settled that he had at least the testimony of Chad's own belief in a settlement? Strether found himself treating Chad's profession that they would get on as a sufficient basis for going to bed. He hadn't, nevertheless, after this gone to bed directly, for when they had again passed out together into the mild, bright night, a check had virtually sprung from nothing more than a small circumstance which might have acted only as confirming quiescence. There were people, expressive sound, projected light still abroad, and after they had taken in for a moment through everything the great clear architectural street, they turned off in tacit union to the quarter of Strether's Hotel. Of course, Chad here abruptly began, 
Of course Mother's making things out with you about me has been natural. And of course also you've had a good deal to go upon. Still, you must have filled out. He had stopped, leaving his friend to wonder a little what point he wished to make. And this it was that enabled Strether meanwhile to make one. Oh, we've never pretended to go into detail. We weren't in the least bound to that. It was filling out enough to miss you as we did. But Chad rather oddly insisted, though under the high lamp at their corner where they paused, he had at first looked as if touched by Strether's allusion to the long sense at home of his absence. What I mean is you must have imagined. Imagined what? Well, horrors. It affected Strether. Horrors were so little, superficially at any rate, in this robust and reasoning image. But he was none the less there to be voracious. Yes, I dare say we have imagined horrors. But where's the harm if we haven't been wrong? Chad raised his face to the lamp, and it was one of the moments at which he had, in his extraordinary way, most his air of designedly showing himself. It was as if at these instants he just presented himself, his identity so rounded off, his palpable presence and his massive young manhood, as such a link in the chain as might practically amount to a kind of demonstration. It was as if, and how but anomalously, he couldn't after all help thinking sufficiently well of these things to let them go for what they were worth. What could there be in this for Strether but the hint of some self-respect, some sense of power, oddly perverted, something latent and beyond access, ominous and perhaps enviable? The intimation had the next thing, in a flash, taken on a name, a name on which our friend seized as he asked himself if he weren't perhaps really dealing with an irreducible young pagan. This description, he quite jumped at it, had a sound that gratified his mental ear, so that of a sudden he had already adopted it. Pagan, yes, that was, wasn't it, what Chad would logically be? It was what he must be, it was what he was. The idea was a clue, and instead of darkening the prospect, projected a certain clearness. Strether made out in this quick ray that a pagan was perhaps, at the pass they had come to, the thing most wanted at Woollett. They'd be able to do with one, a good one. He'd find an opening, yes. And Strether's imagination even now prefigured and accompanied the first appearance there of this rousing personage. He had only the slight discomfort of feeling, as the young man turned away from the lamp, that his thought had, in the momentary silence, possibly been guessed. "'Well, I've no doubt,' said Chad. "'You've come near enough. The details, as you say, don't matter. It has been generally the case that I've let myself go. But I'm coming round. I'm not so bad now.' With which they walked on again to Strether's hotel. "'Do you mean,' the latter asked, as they approached the door, "'that there isn't any woman with you now?' "'But pray, what has that to do with it?' Why, it's the whole question. Of my going home? Chad was clearly surprised. Oh, not much. Do you think that when I want to go, any one will have any power? To keep you, Strether took him straight up, from carrying out your wish? Well, our idea has been that somebody has hitherto, or a good many persons, perhaps, kept you pretty well from wanting. That's what, if you're in anybody's hand, may again happen. You don't answer my question, he kept it up, but if you aren't in anybody's hands, so much the better. There's nothing, then, but what makes for your going. Chad turned this over. I don't answer your question? He spoke quite without resenting it. Well, such questions have always a rather exaggerated side. One doesn't know quite what you mean by being in women's hands. It's all so vague. One is when one isn't. One isn't what one is and then one can't quite give people away. He seemed kindly to explain. I've never got stuck so very hard, and as against anything at any time really better, I don't think I've ever been afraid. There was something in it that held Strether to wonder, and this gave him time to go on. He broke out as with a more helpful thought. Don't you know how I like Paris itself? The upshot was indeed to make our friend marvel. Oh, if that's all the matter with you! It was he who almost showed resentment. Chad's smile of a truth more than met it. But isn't that enough? Strether hesitated, but it came out. Not enough for your mother. 
Spoken, however, it sounded a trifle odd, the effect of which was that Chad broke into a laugh. Strether, at this, succumbed as well, though with extreme brevity. Permit us to have still our theory, but if you are so free and so strong, you're inexcusable. I'll write in the morning, he added with a decision. I'll say I've got you. This appeared to open for Chad a new interest. How often do you write? Oh, perpetually. And at great length? Strether had become a little impatient. I hope it's not found too great. Oh, I'm sure not. And you hear as often? Again Strether paused. As often as I deserve. Mother writes, said Chad, a lovely letter. Strether, before the closed porte cochere, fixed him a moment. It's more my boy than you do, but our suppositions don't matter, he added, if you're actually not entangled. Chad's pride seemed none the less a little touched. I never was that, let me insist. I always had my own way, with which he pursued, and I have it at present. Then what are you here for? What has kept you, Strether asked, if you have been able to leave? It made Chad, after a stare, throw himself back. Do you think one's kept only by women? His surprise and his verbal emphasis rang out so clear in the still street that Strether winced till he remembered the safety of their English speech. Is that, the young man demanded, what they think at Woollett? At the good faith in the question, Strether had changed colour, feeling that, as he would have said, he had put his foot in it. He had appeared stupidly to misrepresent what they thought at Woollett, but before he had time to rectify, Chad again was upon him. I must say, then, you show a low mind. It so fell in, unhappily for Strether, with that reflection of his own prompted in him by the pleasant air of the boulevard Malherbe, that its disconcerting force was rather unfairly great. It was a dig that, administered by himself, and administered even to poor Mrs. Newsome, was no more than salutary, but administered by Chad, and quite logically, it came nearer drawing blood. They hadn't a low mind, nor any approach to one, yet incontestably they had worked, and with a certain smugness, on a basis that might be turned against them. Chad had at any rate pulled his visitor up. He had even pulled up his admirable mother. He had absolutely, by a turn of the wrist and a jerk of the far-flung noose, pulled up in a bunch, Woollett browsing in its pride. There was no doubt Woollett had insisted on his coarseness, and what he at present stood there for in the sleeping street was by his manner of striking the other note, to make of such insistence a preoccupation compromising the insisters. It was exactly as if they had imputed to him a vulgarity that he had, by a mere gesture, caused to fall from him. The devil of the case was that Strether felt it, by the same stroke, as falling straight upon himself. He had been wondering a minute ago if the boy weren't a pagan, and he found himself wondering now if he weren't by chance a gentleman. It didn't in the least, on the spot, spring up helpfully for him that a person couldn't at the same time be both. There was nothing at this moment in the air to challenge the combination. There was everything to give it, on the contrary, something of a flourish. It struck Strether into the bargain as doing something to meet the most difficult of the questions, though perhaps indeed only by substituting another. Wouldn't it be precisely by having learned to be a gentleman that he had mastered the consequent trick of looking so well that one could scarce speak to him straight? But what in the world was the clue to such a prime-producing cause? There were too many clues then that Strether lacked, and these clues to clues were among them. What it accordingly amounted to for him was that he had to take full in the face a fresh attribution of ignorance. He had grown used by this time to reminders, especially from his own lips, of what he didn't know, but he had borne them because in the first place they were private, and because in the second they practically conveyed a tribute. He didn't know what was bad, and, as others didn't know how little he knew it, he could put up with in his state. But if he didn't know, in so important a particular, what was good, Chad at least was now aware he didn't and that, for some reason, affected our friend as curiously public. It was, in fact, an exposed condition that the young man left him in long enough for him to feel its chill, till he saw fit, in a word, generously again to cover him. 
This last was in truth what Chad quite gracefully did. But he did it as with a simple thought that met the whole of the case. Oh, I'm all right. It was what Strether had rather bewilderedly to go to bed on. End of Book Fourth Chapter One